When we light it, we feel excited. We're looking forward to something special. What can it be? When is it going to happen? When we light this candle, we feel hopeful as we wait in this season. This candle reminds us that the prophet Isaiah was longing for God's presence too. It reminds us that the people in the early church we're longing for God's presence. This candle is a symbol for our own longing for God to be with us. We wait and hope for God to surprise us and break into our life. Let us pray today. Oh God, come down with us the land. Give us the courage to spread hope for the world.
Please join me in our call to worship. We come expectantly, eager for this new day to unfold. Awake and arise, let us go to the house of our God. We lay aside our sleepiness and focus our attention. On this new morning, we prepare ourselves to welcome the light of the sun and the light of the world. We come together to greet our God today, tomorrow, every minute, with every breath. Awake and arise. Let us go to the house of our God. Our opening hymn is entitled, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, from the Blue Presbyterian Hymnal on page number nine. <laughs> Please be seated. Our call to confession. We don't know when Jesus will return and we are not to worry about it. But we do know when we do wrong, when we hurt people, when we disappoint God. Yet God will change our sins into acts of mercy and our failures into faith. Join me as we pray to our God, saying, Gracious and almighty God, you know that we fail to live as you would fully live, and we fail to love you who would have to fully love. The result is a world where we live in various kinds of conflict. Consumed by the worries of the world, we struggle to think about anything other than ourselves and our own. It seems our failings only fuel our bad habits of forgetting about you. That we lay before you, holy God, our broken promises, hurtful words, bad intentions, and sinful ways, that you somehow will 
happens into a wholeness, into the endless grace we know through Jesus Christ. Amen. Please use this time for your own private prayer of confession. Amen. Our assurance of pardon. Friends, hear the good news. Our gracious God gathers us from our wearing ways and grants us the freedom to join God's new vision of a peaceful world. Friends, we are free from the prison of war, free to construct peace. I declare to you now that in Jesus the Christ, we are forgiven. morning is entitled Bring Us Hope by Joanne Cyrus.
Thank you, Joanne. Our first scripture reading is taken from the New Testament, the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. Listen to these words. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so, we, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then too will be in the field. No one will be taken and no one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the word of the Lord. I'd like to introduce Reverend Lisa Heckman. Um, again, a thanks to Joanne for beautiful music. Uh, I was also saying to Martha today, the scriptures talk us more about peace today than they do about hope. So I was thankful that the, the anthem brought up hope as well. Can't always get the lectionary to talk to the Advent themes, but that's okay. Matthew, as um, Doug has just read, calls us to be alert, to be prepared, to be ready. Isaiah, prophet, gives us a vision of what is to come. Listen to God's word for us. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of Yahweh's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He will judge between nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of Yahweh. This is God's holy scripture for us. Thanks be to God. Carrie could hardly wait for Christmas. This year, she was old enough to sing in the angel choir, something she'd longed to do since her big, big brother Jet got to do it two years ago. She loved her robe with its silver glitter. She loved her gold halo. Okay, maybe it was cardboard painted gold, but it looked real in the mirror. It was exciting to think about being in the pageant. <gasps> Carrie loved Christmas. It was awfully nice of Jesus to share his birthday. That would be hard. I like having my own birthday, she thought, that I don't have to share. But Jesus was nicer than she was. In fact, Jesus was nicer than anybody. Mommy, how many days until Christmas? Two weeks and three days. How many days is that, Mommy? 
Well, each week is seven days. So 14 days plus three days equals 17 days. Carrie was sad. How could she wait that long when she was ready to burst with excitement? Oh, please, she prayed. Please, Jesus, come soon. I don't think I can wait 17 whole days until Christmas. For us, Christmas is 28 days away, not 17. Do you feel like Carrie, so filled with excitement and ready to burst, that you don't know how you can possibly wait Christmas? I wish I did. My mom's not quite ready to move to Christmas yet because I haven't finished with the remnants of Thanksgiving. There's still unpacking to finish and laundry to be done and yummy leftovers in the fridge. I'm still relishing the wonderful memories of Thanksgiving at my nephew's house in Western Ohio, being there with my family and seeing all of them, including two little ones. And I'm still feeling the after effects of a very long drive home. And yeah, I'm a little bit sleepy this morning. <laughs> when the first Sunday of Advent falls on Thanksgiving weekend, it's always such a jolt to my system. You don't find that? Yeah. Unlike Carrie, I'm glad to have these weeks ahead of us in between to get the decorating done and the cards mailed and presents bought and wrapped and shipped in a few cases. More than that, my spirit needs this time of Advent, of waiting for Christ's coming before I can ever be ready. Yet I have to ask myself, what are you waiting for? Are these next few weeks only about listening to Christmas carols and watching the candles glow or Christmas tree lights in the hopes of getting in the mood for the holiday? Am I waiting for the beauty and mystery and music of Christmas Eve? Am I waiting for New Year's and yet another list of resolutions to change my habits and somehow improve my life? Go to that last one. Is that all I'm waiting for? Is there more to Advent than that? Into my Sondland's reverie breaks words that Paul writes to the Romans. Make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day-to-day -day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off, oblivious to God. The night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. So what is God doing in our world? Why did he send his son so long ago? And what's all this waiting until he comes again? Isaiah gives us clues to that. In a time of war and conflict, when the only two times people knew about were warfare and preparing for warfare, Jesus sent a vision through Isaiah of a different time, a different Israel. The Israel of Isaiah's time had had centuries of being absorbed and exhausted by their day-to-day -day obligations and conflicts, becoming oblivious to God. Even temple worship and sacrifice were just one more obligation. They had begun to, begun to climb other hills to other idols, more convenient to worship, or at least as a means to hedge the bets. They had wandered far from the ways of Yahweh and relied on weapons of war. Isaiah's vision then speaks of a new way of being. God's mountain, Zion, Jerusalem, the place of God's temple will be greater than the hills of all the false gods. It will be the place where all people, both Israelites who have forgotten and the other nations who have never heard, will learn God's ways of peace directly from God, God's self. It will be a place where the implements of destruction will become tools to help things grow. Can you imagine what it would take to actually turn a sword into a plow? 
I once easily tur turned a toy sword into a feather duster with a little help from some duct tape. Love those children's swords. But what time must it take to heat, melt, bend, and reform the metal to make it suitable to its new use as a garden tool? When the people of Rosedale United Church in Toronto, Canada, planted a sanctuary garden on the church grounds, the first shovel full of earth had profound significance. It was dug with a simple trowel, yet it was no ordinary trowel. It had been forged by artist Ken Vickerson from the barrels of firearms confiscated by the Toronto police. The handle of the trowel was made from a piece of wood that had once formed a part of a pew in the church building. In presenting the trowel to the congregation, Vickerson said, after being bombarded with so many images of war and violence, it was a delight to take this part in an act of hope like this. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. The theology of this text is deceptively simple. There is nothing, no gun, bomb, tank, factory, or vacant lot that can't be turned into something else, something good, a shovel, a swing set, a house, a garden. There is no fragment, no molecule in all creation that is not a vessel of God and so a means of life, if we choose to use it as such. Isn't this the core of Jesus' teaching? Where others saw useless and broken people, he saw humanity, possibility, and beauty, shalom unfolding. Peace takes time, though. Lasting change comes slowly. It's hard for us to believe in this fast paced world with a new thing around each corner and waiting for anything is not something we're good at. Perhaps that's because we associate waiting with idleness, time lost, when we could be doing other things. But the scriptures today say, not so. We are waiting, but we're called to be actively participating in God's work while we do so. We're waiting for God's peace to come, but we can do more than just, you know, read a book or play with our phones to ease boredom and pass time. In the village of Bellingham, Australia, way back in 2003 and 2004, the community got very heavily involved in the global vigil for peace leading up to the war in Iraq. The day the war broke out, a group gathered in a park outside the village council offices this had been a prearranged event that would happen should war start. But unlike the other activities of the group, this one was unplanned. Once everyone had gathered, they didn't quite know what to do with themselves. Finally, one suggested that they form a circle holding hands, which seemed as good a thing to do as any. The conversation around the circle talked of two different streams of responses. One group desired to focus on one's inner peacefulness and harmony. Change ourselves into more peaceful individuals, they reflected. And as we live peaceably, the world around us will also change. The social activists though had trouble with this thinking as well as with holding hands for this long. They wanted to get back to marching on the street and sending emails off to the government in protest and generally, generally raising public awareness and dissent. Both responses, though, are needed to bring about peace. Our personal commitment to living and acting peaceably and speaking out like Paul, saying, wake up to others to try to end injustice and conflict in the world. This is more than a good feeling in our souls. God's peace places heavy demands on us. But ultimately, it is God's peace, and it will be God who brings about peace. Are you waiting for peace? Are you waiting for hope? 
Are you waiting for Christ to come and end the madness? Are you waiting for the child to be born in Bethlehem? Or are you just waiting for the presence in eggnog? Hmm? While we wait, we can do, we can prepare, we can help. Mother Teresa once said, peace is not something you wish for. It's something you make, something you do, something you are, something you give away. God has shown us how to walk God's path. Jesus has demonstrated how to do so. So what are we waiting for? Come, let us walk in the light of Yahweh. Amen. Um, let us share together in that new hymn, number 20, Watchman Tell Us of the Night. Affirmation of faith and Advent affirmation. We believe in God, creator and lover of the earth, origin and destiny of us all. We believe in Jesus the Christ, God coming to us in the fragile promise of a baby yet unborn, who emerges as the herald of hope, God's laughter in the face of despair plunged into doubt and hell. He broke free the captives and is leading the way to the land of promise where justice and peace will flourish. We believe in the Holy Spirit who implants the seed of truth, brings us to birth as the body of Christ and empowers us to confront and transform all that is corrupt degrading and deceitful. We believe in the coming reign of God, announced by the Baptist. It has drawn near to us in Jesus and will be consummated in the glorious marriage of earth and heaven. 
when all who have passed through the world's deep sorrow will be raised from the waters, robed in righteousness, and gathered in the joyful fulfillment of God's desire. For the coming of that day, on this day, we work and pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come. You may be seated. Our pastoral prayer today will include times of silence for you to lift up your own prayers. Please join your hearts with me. We bless you, our God, mighty sovereign power, gentle, caring mother. You do not forget your children. We bless you, our God, for your great gifts to us, creation, fragile and fascinating, scripture revealing your truth. And you bless us with your forgiving love, with a vision of your kingdom, shedding light in our darkness. Bless us and disturb us, God, with that vision of your kingdom. And as we voice our hopes to you now, may they strengthen us, reassure us, and move us. God, we pray for those caught up in wars around the world, soldiers, refugees, and those who hold fast to the reasons for the fighting. We pray for homeless folk, excluded from what the rest of us are doing, cold, struggling to keep a hold of who they are. We pray for folk who are ill, coping with pain, fearing the worst, worrying for the future. We pray for those folks struggling in relationships, especially at this family time, when the cracks are kept just below the surface. And for the deepest hopes of our hearts, we pray now. Into the mess of this world, a fragile child will come, yelling in the night for his mother, needing milk and clean linen. We pin our hopes on you, little baby, our God, pushed out into the world through pain and poverty. You, our God, are with us, and our hope is reborn. God and community, holy and one, gather our hearts as we gather our voices to pray as Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On this last Sunday of November, I remind you that our mission focus for the month is team, the uh, ministry that David and Joy Weaver are involved in. Brothers and sisters, we are called to the mountain with people from every nation to unlearn war and to learn peace. We are asked to bring the best of ourselves, and that is what God asks us of us today. Because God has given to us May we give to God so that love and peace and hope and life may flourish in the world. Let us give to God our tithes and our offerings.
one, you know us so deeply and truly. You know our ways with power and our ways with peace. You are far beyond our hopes and our hates. Money is a main tool for making war, and today we humbly ask that you take these gifts, that they may build the world of your compassion, your justice, and your mercy. Amen. Our closing hymn is People Look East, uh, number 12 in the blue hymnal, and we're skipping the third verse. give us courage, give us vision, and give us unending peace. May God guide our journeys that we may bear Jesus' gifts of love and life and hope. And may God bless us through these Advent days ahead. Amen and amen. <laughs>